Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Rocket MSP Podcast. I'm Steve Taylor. I'm your host. Today, I have a very special guest, uh, Harry Brelsford. Uh, Harry is from uh, SMB Nation, as well as 420 MSP. Um, Harry, thank you so much for being here today, man. No, oh, pleasure. I love this stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, we're, we're going to talk about something a, a little... A little different. I've I've actually been wanting to have this conversation for quite some time. Uh, we're going to talk about some weed. Uh, yeah. We're not going to do any weed. You know, as, as much as I like this to be a long form conversational type of thing, and and I I compare myself to Joe Rogan, but for like IT nerds, uh, we're not that Joe Rogan-y. Okay, so yeah. I just turned him into a. What did I turn him into? A, a, adverb whatever it doesn't matter <laughs> um so so let's kind of let's dive in man um so first of all how do you get started in in this you know you, you just uh, like like how did how did you get started working working with this industry like at one point did you just like you talk to your uh your drug dealer and you were like hey man so you want to get Office 365 and, and have some unified communications. And then, you know, you, you got your, your little baggie of weed. I've never actually, I've never actually bought weed from a drug dealer. So I don't. <laughs> no, I'll, 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 I'll set the table. Um, and there's always, you know, this topic always lends itself to a little humor. Yeah. But but this is true. So back in college, uh, and not to date myself, but so I, I worked on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. Grew up in Alaska, worked on the pipeline in the summers, had a little pocket change. So I bought one of the original Apple II Plus computers with the Hayes modem, 300 baht. And it was, you know, all uppercase and 40 characters. So you even had to buy a card, a character extender card to put in the Apple II Plus to get 80 characters and upper and lower. Early days. And what occurred was, uh, and, you know, this is back when everybody had to go to the computer lab, you know, you had to take basic and some other stuff. And so you would literally be sitting in the hallway, like your computing time might be from 11 p.m. to midnight. And you typically had to sit in the hallway and wait till 11 p.m. You had to sit in the line. That's the way it was. And what I discovered was um, I could use the Hayes modem from my apartment and call into the VAX machine. So I didn't have to go to the computer science lab or stand in, in line or wait. And so then my neighbors caught on. And so they started bringing me weed um, in exchange for uh, time sharing. And so I consider myself to be the original cannabis technology time sharing service in the world. <laughs> um, and and it, was, it, it was interesting, the visibility that I got from that, because it was like, you know, there's there's a real exchange of value here, right? Now, in that case, it was barter. But it, it was just very interesting to say, wow, you know, this computers and, and weed, they they might be big someday. <laughs> and and they are. Um, yep. So fast forward the movie. Um, about four years ago, um, well, let me back up. About six, seven years ago, good Lord, seven years ago, I turned over the day-to-day -day of SMB Nation to Jennifer Hallmark. Uh, who's been with me 14 years. And so she makes the trains run on time. And that freed me up, right, to do other neat things. And I did an analytics startup for a couple of years, fasted and exited, and then uh, started hanging out with um, the cannabis technology crowd in Seattle. And that's a really important part of the story because Seattle had gone illegal in 2012. Mm -hmm. Steve, it's hard to believe that was nine years ago. Colorado and Washington State, uh, nine years ago. And oh, has it, it really been that long? Yeah, yeah, and it goes quick. And um, the good news about you know the end of this podcast is it's not too late for you guys to get involved, but we'll we'll work up to that. So I started going to meetups, uh, the meetup.com, you know, and it's really cool Thursday nights at the University of Washington, and it was a cannabis technology meetup, but it's not our technology. It wasn't infrastructure, cybersecurity, or databases. It was more like um, machines that they use in processing and stuff. I can probably, in this, you, you know, like industrial technology, right? A different right. 
kind of technology that that where you and I don't play. Um, and but I, I went and I you know there'd probably be anywhere from eighty to one hundred people. It's a big deal. And then former Microsoft employees, two of my friends, uh, broke away from Microsoft and others have too, and started uh, to startups, cannabis technology startups. So Dauntless. Mm -hmm is a seed, my friends, Dauntless is a seed to sale ERP system. And so it tracks the barcode all the way through the system because there's a whole issue concerning compliance and traceability, right? Much like the pharmaceutical industry where, where you have to trace the, the high cholesterol meds, right? And I can go on and on about why that's important and cool, but the Seattle uh, technology community was, uh, you know, certainly one of the leaders in developing these um, point solutions for the cannabis industry. It's it's a very different industry. So then uh, I went ahead and uh, wrote a book on um, how to be a cannabis MSP. Now, I did this about two and a half years ago, and there was still sensitivity to the word cannabis. And so it's how to be an MSP vertical edition. But when you turn the book around, it talks about all the workloads of cannabis technology, right? Oh, so, Steve. yeah, so we, you know, th this goes back to a different time, Steve, and where people were at a couple years ago. Now, that's radically changed. You can have the open adult conversation of, about the business side of cannabis. But it's, it's fine now. But I did the book, and it was based on if you're an MSP and you want to break into this vertical you know, get the business, manage the business and do the actual work. And um, some people would say, you know, well, the book, you know, could be for any SMB opportunity. And that's true. But I have a couple chapters dedicated specifically to traceability, compliance um, and some of the solutions that are unique in the uh, cannabis vertical. And so one thing led to another. Then we had the show that we we're going to do a three day in Denver uh, last uh, early June. Well, of course, that went online with the pandemic, um, but we all felt pretty good about it. We had some top speakers who who could speak to compliance, and uh, Blue Star uh, Distributing, uh, Dwayne Roebuck talked about you know the the line card that they have as a distributor um, for this vertical. So that was all good, and then. Uh, I started writing for Marijuana Venture Magazine out of Seattle. So I have the monthly cannabis technology column for them. But you see where this is going is I, I'm, I'm putting the pieces in place to present myself as a cannabis technology, hopefully expert, a community. Um, finally, uh, I'm, I'm a partner in a show that's coming up in November in Seattle, November 9, 10, called Retail. Um, <laughs> what is that thing called? It's, uh, re retail Now. And what that's about is for dispensary owners. I'm sorry, Retail Vision. Retail Vision. It's for dispensary owners uh, who want to come and get a two-day sort of ganja grad school degree. Okay, graduate degree for ganja on what is retail and then what is the technology that supports it. And 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 Steve, the, the idea with this is that... Um, my partner, Greg James, the publisher of Marijuana Venture, his career was in retail. So he has speakers from Nordstrom's and Starbucks and Costco coming in. So we're we're trying to get people to go on a two-day retreat and get out of their own way, right? Like Costco knows retail. This is what you do. <laughs> that is so cool, man. So, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, obviously when you got started, you, you, uh, you were a user. <laughs> yeah. You were the you were the end user in that situation. Lifestyle, uh, lifestyle side. <laughs> so, so I mean, are you still on that side? You're you're in Seattle, so recreationally, you you can do what you want. Well, when I'm in Seattle, I can. Right now, I'm actually in Austin, Texas. So oh. I, uh, I I prefer not to answer that question. <laughs> Understood. So, so in the door, I I am in Ohio where uh, some people can get what, what we lovingly call your green card. Um, and, it's, and it's not because I, I, you know, came here from Mexico or something. It's, it's because, you know, I, I could have a medical purpose oh, yeah. uh, and, and I could get a card for that. Um, but in Ohio, you are not allowed to 
I believe they call it combust the marijuana. You're not allowed to smoke it. Okay. You're allowed to do you're allowed to do everything but that. Uh, <laughs> so whatever. Uh, I've honest I've never smoked weed in my life. Yeah. Um, so I find the industry fascinating, but I really don't understand how it works. Like and and to be honest, like I've got a, a really good friend. Um, you know, we, we just started becoming friends over the last couple of years, and he owns a dairy farm. He's got about 1,100 cows across, I want to say, like four or five properties. Wow. And it is it is absolutely awesome in the way, like, it truly leaves me in awe to see, like, how everything functions. And, like, with 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 what he's doing, like, you know... He, he can tell me exactly how many cows he has producing milk. He can tell me what he sells the milk at in bulk, you know, price per gallon to the um, uh, dairymen's or, or superior or whatever, whatever company, you know, he, he sells it to the company that supplies milk. Uh, interestingly enough to Costco and Aldi all across the nation. Yeah. And they've, they've got like hubs all over the country because apparently you don't want to really transport milk across the country. It's more of a regional, like one hub might serve Ohio, Pennsylvania, and I don't know, Kentucky or West Virginia or something. So, so it's interesting seeing like that side of farming and the technology, like, dude, I didn't realize when he was, you know, he's, he's like, you know, early forties, he's in high school and they, they maybe had 50 cows and they still weren't hand milking them. They had some kind of machine, you know, pumping it out of them. So I guess what I'm saying is, you know, we, we all have this idea of what it's like to get milk from a cow thanks to TV, you know, and it's, and it's doing this to the cow and if you got 1,100 of them, that means your your wrists and forearms are going to be real sore, um, or or you've got a lot of employees. He he's able to do like I don't know 12 cows at a time. He's got 18 employees or something crazy like that. Like it is it is truly amazing to to know how much technology they have there. He has a tractor that he can just sit in and it can drive itself. And if he were willing to spend the four thousand dollars it would even get to the end of the row and like turn and then start the next row and then turn and like, it's insane. So, um, so I guess, I guess where I'm going at uh, with this is farming in general blows me away. And then we're talking about an industry that we have not even had legal for a decade, but I mean, you got to think about how much weed is, has been sold across this nation over the last, you know, 20, 30 years. They've already been doing something to farm it really well. And, and now they're just able to do it legally and out in the open, which means now they've got like actual technology with, with warranties and tech support and whatever else. So all the technology for cannabis, is this stuff like basically are these brand new companies that have that have formed to support the cannabis industry or are these are these companies that they already had something that sort of did this so now they're just specializing in this product too for cannabis well it's 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 both and i don't know if you can bring up that logo chart uh on the screen and i'll i'll walk us through it this is probably the best way to answer it folks it's uh from my monthly column and marijuana venture where is it this this is the july issue and this is the ecosystem chart. So I don't know if you can give me a kick on that on screen and I can walk people through it. Yeah, I just need to get that screen shared. And apparently I'm doing it wrong. So it's, it's both. Yeah, while you're doing that, it's it's both. There's clearly uh, a lot of startups in this area. And I'm an advisor um, to, to one in particular. And... Uh, that's I, that's where I'm headed, Steve, career-wise. I, I probably, while you're bringing that up, I'll finish the Harry story. What I want to do by the end of the year is be recognized, because then I'll be entering my fifth year in the cannabis technology field, 
but I want to be recognized as a principal analyst for cannabis technology. So private equity firms, venture capital firms, investors would hire me to uh, lay out the landscape, right? Because okay. private equity plays in this game. And so, you know, what they like to do is they like to go hire Gartner or um, Forrester or Yankee Group or IDC, the big research houses, um, to validate investments, right? And the big research houses are not touching this vertical right now. I am. And literally. <laughs> Please don't die on me. Yeah. So that's what the uh, the chart is. Um but uh, basically what we did with the chart was uh, we went ahead and um, well, while you're bringing that up, but we went ahead and created buckets. There we go. So every industry has the ecosystem logo chart. And I had a lot of help with this from Ryan Porter, who a uh, uh, young man who had a very handsome exit from his first cannabis company and now is uh, uh, got a second one over in cannabis um, employee, retail employee training. That's a whole nother story. Um, but he kind of helped me line it up as to what the buckets are. So a couple that stand out would be what I, the aforementioned seed to sale. And if you look in the upper left, the Harley Davidson logo, third one down, right column. Yeah. Up. yeah, that's Dauntless. Okay, that's Dauntless out of Redmond, Washington. One of the early seed to sale, and again, this is, uh, Steve, very much like SAP or Microsoft Dynamics, right? It's Got it. E okay. It's, it's ERP, and literally from start to finish. Uh, the the other big player early on was Trees with the letter Z, um, and, and you can see that logo. But let's get back to your question about is it existing companies or new, and I said both. If you go down to infrastructure, you'll see some familiar names. Okay. So for example, uh, Zebra, Hyper Yellow, Brother. Yeah, it, I, mean, I, I know a lot of these. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Star. Um, so and it's interesting because a lot of these I would, I would associate with point of sale. Well, and, and they do, they, they, they do support that. They support the labeling and the point of sale point of sale. Uh, at mid uh, the second half of my chart up there, those are actual, you know, point of sale software applications, okay, to to run the cash register, for lack of a better word, but they are uh, associated with point of sale. And so, so here, one of my columns was what makes a a company a cannabis technology company in my eyes, right? And it's uh, a little bit objective and a little bit subjective, right? And I'm, you know making this chart up as I go and I refine it and a year from now, it's going to be even bigger. Um, but if you take uh, brother and what we found with brother, I, I had a couple of conversations with them. Um, initially I would not have put brother uh, on a chart like this. Cause you know, you know, brother printers. Um, well, it turns out they're, they're more than that. Uh, they have some mobile solutions that work well with the uh, the supply chain of cannabis. Back to your point about out on the farm and that kind of thing, um, where you have to label the, the the plant, the stock of the cannabis plant with a, a barcode um, or RFID. But I talked to Brother twice and I said, you know, why should I put you on the logo chart? Because Steve, if I put everybody on the logo chart, like Adele and Lenovo, you know, you walk into a, a cannabis entity and they they have uh, Lenovo machines, does that make Lenovo a Canatech company? Absolutely not. But with Brother, they have a group uh, that is, um, they have committed resources, two individuals on the payroll targeting this vertical. Uh, they've gone to most of the big shows in the industry, so they have the commitment of actually, you know, showing up and suiting up. For for example, the big dog in our industry, um, love to invite everybody to come, is uh, the MJ BizCon is in mid-October in Las Vegas. Uh, two years ago when I went, 35,000 attendees, about, seven, I'm going to say maybe 1,500, 1,700 booths over three days, and I'll tell you, it's hell on wheels. Um and a lot of these logos will be there. But does that make sense? What I tried to kind of work out with Brother was, you know, I, I need to see a dedicated resource, you know, your sincerity. 
And then I need to see that you're going to the shows and you're active, yeah. reading the magazines and you're running ads. And I said, gentlemen, you are now a Canna Tech company in my mind's eye. Any, any, any questions? You, you, you started taking me down that road. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. So um, I, I do want to start asking questions. Um, so I want to start out with um, just asking some of the questions that I'm seeing from the, from the people watching. So um, if there are good ERP systems, why are there all these third parties for financial services or fintech? Oh, uh, down at the bottom? I, I, if I if I think I understand the question right, um, so so let me let me try two things. One is uh, up in the upper left. I have my magazine open now, mm -hmm. so I can see it. So up in the upper left with seed to sale, aka ERP. Um, these are targeting this specific vertical, right? So and and it's got again a half a dozen to a dozen nuances that have to kind of be built into the code, in particular, hooking metric. Uh, if you go to the middle of the page under compliance, you'll see metric. That's the API that's most used to pump the uh, data from seed to sale up to the liquor and cannabis control boards like the state of Washington, because this thing is heavily regulated and taxed. Now, to answer the question, on the, I, if I understand correctly, the financial services down below um, these are a work in progress, right? Because this is a cash industry. It's a, it's a, and, and that's part of uh, the opportunity and the problem. Um, what some of these companies are doing is what we call off the rails. And it's, it's a little too close to the yellow line for me, Steve. I mean, I recognize they're mm. using technology to do this. But they're doing off the rails. And by analogy, you can kind of think of the way Venmo and PayPal work, right? Kind of kind yeah. of outside the banking system. Um, and so what you have is uh, a couple of these logos um, change the, the coding of the uh, credit card transactions. So they got a simple example would be you, you go and buy the weed, but maybe they ring it up like it would be if you went to a nursery and bought flowers. Right. So they're coding it. Um, and to me, that I, I, I don't want to be in that line of work, Steve. I that that does yeah, that that does seems right. <laughs> that seems, you know, disingenuine. And that that seems like they're on the other side of that yellow line. Yeah. You yeah. I, mean? I, I agree. <laughs> so and and then so Shiva also asked, um, you know, why are there point of sale? And I think I can actually answer this one. Um, so some some companies need seed to sale. They need the ERP because they're uh, they're the ones that are like growing. Uh, you know, they've got the farm, they've got the farmers, and um, maybe they also have the uh, machinery facility, whatever. To um, and and here's where I don't under yeah, I don't, and here's where I don't understand. Like you know, they got to pull the the weed buds off the plants and and like all that stuff, right? And and a lot of that stuff's done by by industrial stuff, machinery. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's I, not like people are there. Like okay, here's one, and like that that just that would cost a lot of money. But then there's the dispensaries where you know they just they just purchase. They're they're like Giant Eagle, you know, like or or uh, whatever your grocery stores. They're like Walmart. That's that's one well, of those. Yeah, they're they're more like the old timey drugstore on Main Street. Yeah, well, I guess I was trying to I was trying I, to make know, an analogy. They yeah. they they buy somebody else's product at you know wholesale or or whatever, oh, and yeah. then they put it on the shelf and they sell it for retail. Yeah, and some of this stuff, um, some of the prices I believe might be state mandated, like you have to sell it for at least X amount. No, I don't know how. Yeah, let me well let, let me unpack a few things there. So the supply chain has three train stops. Okay, at, at the top, there we go. You have the grower, the, the farmer. It's just like your 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 rancher buddy. It's it's just uh, they're farmers. Okay, I yeah. mean it's nothing really special other than you have to have security and barcoding and all that, but um, which you don't really have to do with uh, corn stocks, but. Um, then you have the manufacturers and the processors right in the middle, okay? And that's where they're going to make the, the best example is the edibles, right? And edibles are a really popular category, Steve. Uh, I would never put 
anything in my lungs again. I have a hard enough time breathing. I, I don't, I don't smoke, no nothing. Even when babies are born, I don't do cigars. Um, and so there's a lot of people who don't like to smoke, but they like, you know, the ability to sleep like a baby at night from uh, an edible. Um, and that's almost getting over to the medical conversation. That's stop number two. Stop number three is the dispensaries or the retail. And that is the supply chain. Now, what's interesting is seed to sale, that category, it quote unquote might go away. And here's why. First of all, vertical integration is not allowed in the state of Washington because they wanted to keep crime out. And that's actually good. And, and, and I'll get back to that. But the state of Oregon and other states allow vertical integration. So you could only have a seed to sale solution or, or the, the highest value of it would be in states that allow vertical integration, right? Because you're the farmer, you're the manufacturer, and you're the store, okay, in theory. Um, now, seed to sale can play in the state of Washington because you can have three separate logons and instances for the players, and, and we can track everything. But that category could go away when we become federal legal, right? Because uh, the feds may not allow, allow vertical integration. There is a concern about organized crime, and that's where the industry kind of came from, the black market. But you know what's really interesting is people from – Portland, if you look at a heat map, and I, I spent some time in government affairs uh, early in, in my reentry into this field. If you look at the heat map uh, uh, along the Oregon uh, Washington border, it, it turns red in Vancouver, Washington, right across the border, right across the river. And I'm like, well, why, why is this so? Why is it red, indicating a lot of activity? Spokane, Washington, I totally understand because you have Idaho right across the border. So the people come over from Idaho, buy the weed and drive home. I get Spokane. Well, the problem with uh, vertical integration is they don't have the variety because, because they own the farm, they own the manufacturer. They typically only carry their products on the store shelves. So they have- so they're, really not, good. they're not gonna have all the, all the variety of, of a store in uh, Vancouver, Washington, right? Because Vancouver, Washington can work with multiple sources, right? Right. And they want to. So state of Washington stores are gorgeous with all this variety. You go down to Oregon and it's typically uh, looks a little bit like Moscow, right? Kind of bare shelves. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they, they don't have the variety. And that's a nuance that people don't think about. And it's, to be honest, it's why you don't want vertical integration, right? Let everybody do what they do best and cross pollinate, cross sell to each other. That makes sense. Yes. All right. So let's, let's start talking about what all of this, how, how all of this kind of works for the MSP. So um, this is not legal federally. So like you said, you know, financial services, they're they're kind of towing that line, right? They're playing well, all sorts of tricks, gift cards, you name it. They're playing tricks. Yeah. So there are some banks that can work with this industry. Yeah. And it's because they're not FDIC, correct? Yeah. So in the state of Washington, it's the uh, state chartered credit unions are big in this reindeer game. Got it. Okay. Um, and that, that works because now they've got a, a checking account, they've got a debit card, right? Yeah. Okay. So a company, uh, in the state of Washington could hire, we'll just say rocket MSP to be their MSP and they can put their credit card on file and I can ding them every month. Correct. So that's easy. But some States do, do some States not have a state credit union or, or something like that, or are some credit unions FDIC? How does that work? Well, it's 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 pretty straightforward. So the the first answer is I I don't know. I I, I don't know the financial, you know, I haven't double clicked in the financial services. Um Got it. now that said, in the state of Washington, the store itself still takes cash. So you have to bring in cash to the store, but the difference with the credit unions is that um, 
you can take the cash to the credit union and put it in your your, your bank account, okay? Versus having a huge, you know, vault or safe. Um, mm. And that's a whole nother conversation about security. But the, uh, the, the other thing, Steve, is um, as an analyst, and I don't touch the flower in the supply chain, that's the sticky part, is if you're touching the flower, you're not bankable. But if I open myself up as a, an, an analytics firm or analysis firm, I, I can be paid by the, you know, by, by the cannabis dispensary with a credit card or a check, right? And that's because um, it, uh, another example would be lawyers, right? There's all these law firms specializing in the field of cannabis in general. They, they get paid like any, uh, you know, any, any client would pay a lawyer. You see what I'm saying? They, they don't yes. wheel wheelbarrows of cash into the law firm <laughs> to pay them. <laughs> that that would be fun, though. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking Scrooge McDuck, you know. So, um, you know, I, I remember hearing stories about, uh, you know, dispensaries and other, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep calling them weed companies because it sounds more ominous that way, right? So I, I keep hearing of, uh, you know, these places – using almost like a shell company or holding company where like um, somehow the employees are all employed by company A, the the dispensary might be company B. Company A is paying payroll and taxes and all that other stuff, whereas company B, the dispensary, is just paying a simple service fee to company A or whatever to, you know, to pass the funds through. Is that money laundering? Like what, what's going on here? Well, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. I, I mean, I, I believe what you're saying and, and I'm sure it's going on. Um, but, but yeah, some of this stuff does kind of feel like money laundering. You know what I mean? It, 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 mm -hmm. it, it has that feel and that's why, you know, this industry is, is young and young and dumb. And, and when it becomes federal legal, all that's going to get cleaned up. Right. That's all going to get cleaned up. And, you you know, you bet you the federal government's going to want their share of uh, tax revenue. Um, and it's significant, the markups for taxation. Uh, state of Washington pulls in a billion a year now from uh, taxes related to the cannabis industry. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's big. Um, That's just one state. Like, I'm looking at this and thinking, like. You know, if we had this legalized across the entire country and it was medicinal and recreational across the entire country, I wonder, like, do you think we could get up to a trillion dollars in tax revenue for uh, for the country? Hmm. Could we completely fix our budget? <laughs> Thanks to weed. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, th this is going to rival the... Uh the, the alcohol, alcohol beverage industry, right? We came out of prohibition, it became legal. There's some real analogies there and it'll probably rival it in terms of size. Um, I, I like to tell a joke, you know, my reputation in my career was known for small business server. That's where I made my name mm -hmm. in the day. And I thought, you know, that would change the world. And it, it, it you know, we, we kind of did. Um, it did. It just also evolved with the way technology evolved. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you know, Microsoft 365, um, like business, that is small business server. It's just all in the cloud. Well, the 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 joke is this: when I give speeches on Canatech, like like this podcast, you know, it's like, man, I I thought small business server was a big deal. Turns out, more people globally like cannabis than they like small business servers. So this is a huge. Vertical. That's the point I'm trying to make. Is it's right up there with um, alcohol and and liquor in terms of market sizing. Um, but another thing about the shell companies, uh, and this is one of the challenges, and I write it up in the book. All the uh, cannabis control boards they go by different names in different states. Liquor and cannabis control board in the state of Washington, um, down in Olympia, Washington. But they all publish uh, the license holders. Okay, so everybody that bought a license to grow, manufacture, or be a dispensary, it's uh, public information on their websites. Go get it. Here's the problem, Steve. A lot of those are using LLCs like real estate deals to hide the identity 
of you know the the billionaires that are buying condos in New York City. You know the game, right? You don't you don't really you, you, you know so and so owns that condo down the floor in New York City, but you don't really know it's so and so because they have a you know company name like Big Apple LLC. And so the challenge is, is you actually have a really hard time of finding who to cold call, right? Because typically these LLCs are using an agent, right? They'll have the agent's name, maybe their lawyer. And so you, you know, you, you look up the individual and you call them and it's a lawyer, you know, and here you are trying to sell a point solution in technology. Um, so that's one of the challenges to, to, to break into this industry is the the way they hide stuff on an llc <laughs> all right um so if if i wanted to start providing msp services is it does it make sense to start with one type of company like should i should i say you know i want to provide it services to uh the farm or I want to provide it to the dispensaries or uh, can you just go out all of them or you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let me give you maybe a couple of examples. Um, Luis Alvarez, uh, well-known MSP in our space speaks at channel pro conferences frequently on IOT. Um, that's kind of his front story, but he's in Salinas, California, central California, you know, the grapes and the, 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 this and the, that, the farming, and I think his MSP practice is 20 plus years old. He's uh, successful. I think he has 40 employees. And one of his verticals was agriculture and uh, the wine industry, right? And so he built his reputation there and they're using the IOT things to monitor the moisture in the soil and all that, you know, farming sophisticated. And it's all that. Well, needless to say, nine years ago, in, or well, California is, I think, about five years ago, a handful of years ago when California went legal, um, he, he was right there. I mean, he literally had vertical expertise about agriculture, and then he's gone ahead to pick up uh, expertise at the dispensary level, but he does the whole supply chain as an MSP. Um, and and is pro he's our leading MSP in Canatech. There's, there's no question about it. So for him, it was just a natural act to get into this vertical. And he knows, you know, he's in these communities. Everybody knows everybody in these farming communities. So it's, you know, he grew by referral. And then once you get your first one, then you have a reputation, right? It, it, it's far easier to get that second and third client. Um, Josh Weiss at LA Creative um, is probably more the, the use case that makes sense. So he's an MSP uh forever and a day uh took advantage of continuum back when it was called that mm -hmm. um I, I get do they still call it continuum after the acquisition i think i think yeah so he, he he was using the outsourced help desk right so he didn't have to have a staff to do the one two and three tiers um, so he's that guy and he has been making progress. I think it's a little slower than he'd like into the Southern California uh, cannabis vertical market by going to the meetups and he goes to the cannabis investor meetups and the one down in the LA area has like, you know, 1800 members signed up and maybe again, one to 200 people who go um, to the monthly meeting and then he does a tabletop. He does a tabletop at the monthly meeting. Now, obviously, COVID, you know, yada, yada, yada. We got sure. away from that, and he's got to get back to it. But it takes time, Steve. I think Josh is a really good use case of the kind of people listening today that, you know, guys, I'm four years in, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and guess what? I got involved with SBS in 97 behind the scenes, and it really wasn't until the 2003 edition hit that, let's just say, the ship came in. I mean, dude, what was that? It took me five or six years to, to get into that vertical and monetize it. And, and Steve, I think that's common for almost any vertical, right? If, if you were a law firm and you said, we're going to start a new antitrust practice, you know, and we're going to ramp up and hire people. Dude, it, it takes a couple of years to, to break into a vertical. <laughs> And that I do want people to, to really be thinking about is, uh, 
it's going to take time. Now, the good news is you're not too late. It's still the Wild West. It's chaotic. And um, and thank goodness we're doing a slow roll. And, and here's what I mean, Steve, as if, you know, Washington and Colorado kind of got it going and then Oregon and then California. Well, California learned from those other states, right, that they, they learned what worked and what didn't. And it gave the industry, the MSP, time to uh, say, hey, my state is, you know, Oklahoma, and they're medical legal and headed to recreational legal. But um, thank goodness all 50 states didn't pop at once. You know what I'm trying to say? That Because the opportunity wouldn't be there for the average MSP today versus it's still there. And especially in New York that popped earlier this year and New Jersey last November in the election, those are some big dogs. And it typically takes after, you know, the, the voters say yes. And I've gotten an art. It used to take 18 months before the first dispensary opened, right? Because uh, you have to build it. You, you have to grow the supply chain. You have to get all the permitting. The permitting was always the, the slow motion. Mm -hmm. Um, but I got in an argument with uh, you know a couple of industry folks, and they said, "No, you know, I bet you New York will be six months, not eighteen months. Better hurry." And Steve, the reason is, is New York has now learned from thirteen other states. They don't have to learn; <laughs> they they just have to do. <laughs> so, um, so, so, what are your predictions for the cannabis industry? Yeah. Yeah. What I'm thinking uh, is, uh, again, I'll do a little storytelling. The the old joke in the nuclear winter of the phone industry just after dot gone. So the early 2000s. And, and you know, you you remember all that hoo-ha where the people were laying down nationwide uh, fiber across the country. And a lot of those companies aren't even here anymore. Sort of the telecom boom. Um and, and the joke was, uh, Lord, just give me another telecom boom, and I promise I won't piss it away this time. And, and so this is the new SBS opportunity. So let me frame it up, right? We, SBS good and, you know, a decade plus opportunity. That's what I predict for this is I think you're going to see a 10-year run, uh, which is all some of us need to get across the finish line, right? Mm. And, and then we're done. I think it's a 10-year opportunity before it becomes a very mature, consolidated industry, just like alcohol. Um, and alcohol has, you know, let's say maybe the five major brands of beer. But here's the good news is right beneath it were all these independent craft breweries, right, that mm -hmm. were created in a response to not everybody likes Pabst Blue Ribbon, right? And so then you had this little industry beneath it. That's where we're headed. You're going to get down to, you know, probably – five big players in this industry uh and 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 the alcohol companies are investing in this industry you know the 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 group uh that does corona beer has a huge investment up in canada because it is federal legal so they they play better when it's federal legal um hmm. but it's going to be a 10-year run and then it's going to look just like the the alcohol industry which is you know arguably it's 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 mature I, you know, I'm sure they have year over year growth, but it's not like coming sure. out of prohibition. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. And so and, go ahead. Uh, well, so what, what should the MSPs be doing today in order to get their, their toes wet? It's, it sounds like, you know, if it's going to take a couple years for us to start to be trusted in the industry, it sounds like the, the very first thing we need to be doing is, uh, finding meetups and conferences and whatever else where we can uh, introduce ourselves and just have conversations with uh, the companies in our region. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, and I, I write about this. First of all, you can create the meetup. Okay. So you could do that and you're Steve, you could do that when we get off the line. I, I think it's $22 a month to, you know, have the little meetup instance. Um, mm -hmm. I did that to get a screenshot because that's what I recommend. I created a Seattle cannabis technology meetup just to get the screenshots. I forgot to cancel it, right? I got busy. I forgot about it. 
I went back um, like 11 days later and there were 76 members. <laughs> like, are you, That's are pretty you, awesome. Are you kidding me? So then at that point, you're not going to cancel because you've got all these people that are interested, right? That, that, that's right. We we had a couple of online meetings and I, I need to do it again. But yeah, I acquired an audience. So not only go to the meetups, but be the meetup. And, and that works in Texas, right? Texas has hemp and CBD. Uh, the, you know, they, they don't have the uh, THC-based uh, plants, of course. But if you're listening in Dallas, my friend Ryan Becker, create the meetup. There's a real hunger for people to talk about the technology surrounding this. Number two, read the journals. And so, folks, uh, shout out to my friends over at Marijuana Venture Magazine. The reason I like working for this magazine is this is on the business side. It's not on the Cheech and Chong lifestyle side. There's a lot of lifestyle magazines like High Times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's all giggles, but read the journals and then go to the conferences. So a couple to think about. Um, the uh, MJ BizCon is uh, mid-October in Las Vegas. And Steve, it's really cool. I only buy the Expo Pass. They have speeches, but they're not known as an academic conference with 35,000 people and 1,500 booths. Um, the, right now, the pass is two ninety nine dollars for a three-day, a three-day Expo hall pass, a hundred bucks a day. Yeah, it, it, it's it's you know chump change, right? I mean, you yeah. guys just go, and I will be doing some kind of meetup there. Um, you know, you know, because I now have an audience and put out the word. You know, Thursday night at eight p.m. You know, meet at my Airbnb, and we'll sit out back. That's you know, good old SMB Nation style, right? Community building. So you know. Uh, keep in touch with me up on LinkedIn is the easiest way to find me. And then finally would be the trade associations. Okay. So you want to get involved in that. And every legal state has, you know, the association, really, really smart people. Um, I'm involved in the one in the state of Washington there. I mean, there's a couple in each state, but the one I'm involved in is in the state of Washington, but one that anybody can be involved in is uh, a friend of the family. So the RSPA, the Retail Solution Provider Association, RSPA, it's at gorspa.org. They have a cannabis community. Yesterday was our monthly meeting. These are the individuals doing point of sale. Okay, at the dispensary, that's what they do, the RSPA. And, um, I think they have 2,000 members of which 200 are part of this cannabis community, a little SIG, special interest group. And yesterday we had over 50 uh, on the call. And that's, I'd, I'd recommend, I'd, I'd recommend that, you, you know, what, what did we cover off on? We covered off on go to meetups, be the meetup, go to conferences, read the journals and, and do the trade association thing. And, and again, I write all that up in my, how to be an MSP, cannabis MSP. Folks, I actually published the table of contents and the index over at uh, 420 MSP. If, if you'd like to see where I, what direction I went with that. Um, happy to, you know, happy to have that talk if you think uh, that's interesting. But Steve, that's kind of the, the, the five point strategy today, you know, to get into the industry. And I didn't mean to be discouraging that you won't get your first client for two years. I'm just saying, manage your expectations, man. You're going sure. into a new vertical. <laughs> yeah. And and you're going into a vertical where um, rightfully so is probably very closed up. They're probably very uh, paranoid. They're, they're probably very clicky, if you know what I mean. Like, oh, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. They're probably paranoid, too. Um I, I know a, a gal who may have um, tried some tea and uh, not, uh, not, it was like the honey that you put in tea and um, it, it maybe was too much honey oh, yeah. in her tea. Oh, and, yeah. and she just, uh, she just laid down and went to sleep and then woke up and, uh, kept saying all these paranoid things for about two hours until she finally had it out of her. Well, that's that's actually a, a valid point. Um, 
the uh, over on the lifestyle side, I here, here's what I know to be true is that the the number one problem with consumption, and you typically see it with tourists, um, and they go to Colorado, right? They 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 go. They're from a, a state such as yours. They go skiing in Colorado. Well, of course, they 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 go buy some peanut butter cups or some edibles, right? And enjoy themselves. The number one problem is, is if you don't have a tolerance, you should probably cut that one peanut butter cup in half. Uh, so they're typically oh, 10 milligrams. So you only get to go five if you're new to this. And and Steve, you know, a friend of mine went to uh, Oregon. It's from Connecticut. And he called me on the phone all giggly like, ah, I just went into a dispensary and bought gummy bears. And I'm going to take three. And I said, dude you're going to the emergency room. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem too smart. Um, huh. So, so. Uh, hey, do you have when, that other chart? Um, before, yeah. Before we run out of time, because, you know, your question was, how, how do we kind of do it? And that's the big question. Harry, how do I do it? And the logo chart you showed earlier is is one thing. It gives you the landscape of the ecosystem, right? Okay, I get it. Here's the player. Oh, 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 there's brother printers. This other chart you're going to bring up is what people are really asking for, and it's my August column in uh, Marijuana Venture Magazine. So still time to go over there and sign up for the magazine. But this is the one, um, and you know, I won't go into it. We, th this is the big scary chart. Right. And the idea was an MSP, and this kind of relates to the dispensary level, not not the grow. You, you can make the same thing for manufacturing and, and growing. But this is something you would print out and take to the dispensary owner and and present this workflow. And this is why they hire the MSP. Right. Because this is harder, this is tougher sledding than it looks. Look at the complexity of this. The simple part of it is, is you just follow the green arrows, and that's what they call follow the money. But you, you see what I'm saying, Steve, is this is a very sophisticated in industry with a lot of opportunity. I mean, how cool is that? And folks, this is how you would educate yourself on it and position yourself as an MSP, and they're going to look to you as the one throat to choke. So you're going to have to get familiar with... Uh, you know, the web hosting, that's a no brainer for their website, but the menu and ordering system, right? With COVID and with customer sophistication, you can now, you know, look in real time at the inventory of those peanut butter cups at your favorite dispensary and reserve the uh, reserve two bags of peanut butter cups. That's menu and ordering, and you you can imagine, brother, the challenges are to keep that up to date with the inventory that's available. You know, this is an SMB, and it's harder than it looks. <laughs> but but this is your roadmap to to start at the dispensary level, which which is great. That 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 might be where you want to start, and then you know the easiest pathway to get up to speed and meet people would be that RSPA trade group that focuses on this chart. Well, this is really cool, man. I, I will say that it, it's, it's almost over. Like, like when I look at this chart, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest, this chart actually makes it really easy for me. This does not look difficult. Okay. So they've got easy a for you, but it's to scare the dispensary owner. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I need an MSP. <laughs> Right. So you're yeah, because the, the CRM, I mean, okay, line of business app, web hosting, I do it all day, every day, website analytics, duh. Um, point of sale system, I assume, is probably where um, the dispensary is going to be, not at a seed to sale. Yeah, although, although they have to integrate because that barcode uh, – is the same barcode that was on the stock of the plant. So they they trace all the way from literally seed to sale, and it's actually three barcodes. The first barcode is at the uh, at, at, at the grower. The second barcode is at the um, 
the manufacturer, right? The packaging and labeling, and that's a whole another story. And then the third barcode is at the store itself for their inventory system, and they all have to be reconciled. And you cannot be off, right? If you're off, it's the same as if a small pharmacy loses a fentanyl patch. You must immediately report it to the state regulators that you lost the patch or you lost, you know, you lost track of something um, or else you will be fine and shut down. And, and uh, is part of my research. So I go to the dispensary back in Seattle on Bainbridge Island and I'm talking to them and about the peanut butter cup thing. And somehow they had one package of peanut butter cups that got out of kilter with the tracing and Steve, they couldn't sell it. They, they're, they're like, it, it, this can't be sold, right? This has to go back because the chain of custody was broken for whatever re bad barcode barcode fell off, something happened. And they like, well, we gotta, we gotta put this back in the closet and kick it back to the, uh, the manufacturer, if that makes sense. It does. And does that mean like, you know, one, one thing's off, does that mean all of that product or just everything from like that case? No, and it was actually just one package. Uh, imagine a package that looks like Reese's peanut butter cups. You know how you mm-hmm. can buy them in the tin pack kind yeah. of thing. It, it looks just like that. Now the the packaging is uh, we'll call it childproof. Um, it's it's a thicker packaging, and you know that's heavily regulated. But Steve, in this case, it was just one one bag, one package, and for whatever reason, it was off and. But the point is, that's interesting that they couldn't sell it, right? They couldn't sell it to you, nor would they. It's like, oh, come on, guys, you know, just how about under the table? And right, but they they can't <laughs> because it was also tr- like as it should be. Uh, chain of custody also shows that it made it to them. So if they can't sell it for any reason, and then they can't uh, like come up with it in their inventory. Uh, now they're in trouble for probably a different reason. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, you know, you're hitting on something. I um, Some of the development that's going on is back on seed to sale uh, is based on blockchain as mm. well as payments. Okay, because uh, crypto, the state of Washington takes cryptocurrency for its tax payments. Uh, and I forget which one it was. It's, it's not the main one we all know. It was, you know, there's a handful of, you know, cryptocurrencies, but they take. I bet one. it's Dogecoin. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but sorry, you, you must not understand the the joke there. Sorry. Oh, all right. Well, it's, it's not where I, I live. But when when you describe the cannabis technology supply chain, people are like, you know, chain of custody and tracking and the public ledger of truth. They're like, this this fits, right? This fits the cannabis supply chain, and it does. So you're seeing solutions develop that way, but then you're also seeing solutions like D365 Cannabis is a large Microsoft partner um, for uh, uh, Dynamics 365, right? And all they did was reskin it. So all it is is Dynamics 365. They said, we're going to be in this vertical. And they just put a pretty face on it. So they had very little development work other than customizations, of course. But so you see both. You see, you know, the seed to sale from the ground up with either proprietary code or uh, kind of go down the blockchain path or just reskin SAP, just reskin uh, Dynamics. So that that's what you're kind of seeing. And if you are a Dynamics partner, um, you, you, you've kind of got a leg up on getting into this industry, right? I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of right at the heart of a lot of the workflow. <laughs> hmm. um, all right. Well, Harry, thank you so much for, for coming on here and educating us a little bit about the, uh, the cannabis industry and, and a little bit about how things work and the technology behind it. And, and truly there's, there's a lot more involved than, uh, you know, just somebody growing weed in the middle of, a uh, of, you know, field somewhere that nobody knows about and then selling it on a street corner. Now it's, there's literally a supply chain. And, and it, I mean, seriously, I think there was probably always a supply chain. There's just a little, you know, 
again, a, a more legitimate one now. Well, not so. only legitimate, yeah, and I'll end on this. Uh, two, two and a half years ago, I went to South by Southwest here in Austin, and um, they had, that's a 10-day conference. It's huge. It's all that. And it'll be back next year. And they had, uh, over the course of the 10 days, they, they had a cannabis track. Okay. And that's kind of goofy to be in Texas and everybody's studying the field of cannabis all the way from creativity to technology. Uh, so I went, right. I didn't go all 10 days, um, but I, I, I went to the lectures and there was a, uh, a mom who, you know, sitting outside the door and I pull up to take a call and then, you know, how you doing? And we start talking and she started out opposed to the legalization of cannabis. I said, yes, ma'am. And then I said, well, well hold, 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 rewind, rewind. The cool thing about the legalization of cannabis is we can do recalls. And that was um, at a time where uh, the, the what was that in Philadelphia about two, two and a half years ago, they had some weird weekend with the fentanyl patches or fentanyl that it had been poisoned. And a lot of people died in Philadelphia one weekend. I mean, it was like maybe mm. poison, you know, 13 people sick. I mean, it was on the news. And that's because that's a black market with no quality control. So right. A, we have quality control with the supply chain. B, we can do recalls, right? And and then she was like, well, you know, I just don't want my high school kids to get cannabis. And I'm like, ma'am, uh, they, they already are, <laughs> okay? At least here, we, we, we can actually maybe do a little bit better job of protecting it from minors like liquor, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, we, we have a leg up on trying to regulate it a little bit better. Um, but man, yeah, it is, it is they, literally they impossible for, in high school. <laughs> yeah, it is literally impossible for teenagers to get a hold of alcohol. So, um, yeah, you know, legalizing marijuana, it'll, it'll definitely prevent them from ever getting a hold of that substance again, too. Yeah. And, and so I, I believe by the end of our 20 minute conversation, I convinced her to get involved. I said, that's fine. If you oppose it, I said, you really should be going to these committee meetings at the state government level. I, first of all, get involved. Even mm -hmm. if you oppose it, get involved, but be smart, educate yourself. And what I see Steve, you know, nine times out of 10 is when someone was initially imposed, uh, opposed to it, they hadn't educated themselves. And if they go to these, you know, uh, liquor and cannabis control board meetings and get involved and maybe get on a committee, um, ultimately they see why we should legalize it and regulate it, right? They, they tend to come around. <laughs> so. Well, um, I, I would love to pick your brain some more sometime. So I, you know, I can't wait to invite you back here again. Yeah, but well, let's do it. So, seriously, thank you so much for, for coming on here and, and having this conversation with me today. And uh, good luck, maybe or maybe not, uh, with some gummies or something. <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Steve. I sure appreciate it. My pleasure. Hey, everyone that uh, is still sticking around, uh, thanks so much for watching today's uh, podcast episode. Make sure you like and subscribe and ring the bell and all that other weird stuff that people do on YouTube. Uh, so that way you can get notified of upcoming episodes and uh, help spread the word. Thanks so much, guys. Take care.